Buenos dias. My name is Rafael Perez Figueroa. I'm an assistant professor of health behavior in society. And on behalf of the Inclusive Excellence Committee at the University of Kentucky College of Public Health, I want to welcome you to this symposium. We must acknowledge the support of the Center for Innovation in Population Health, the Center for Health Equity Transformation, the Office of Institutional Diversity of, at the University of Kentucky, and very especially to the students of the College of Public Health at the University of Kentucky. We are very excited at having the opportunity of engaging you in this conversation. At the same time, the topics that we will be discussing today are nothing to be excited about. Across the country, Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Asian, and other people of color face striking inequities in health outcomes. Those inequities are rooted on oppressive structural forces, such as racism, xenophobia, and violence. These disparities in combination with insufficient national response have fueled the COVID-19 crisis, and they are not limited to health. They permeate all levels of our society, undermining justice and democracy. We join those across the nation that demand justice and have no doubts, racism and the killings of black men and women in this country is a public health crisis. For those of you who are members of communities of color across the nation, know that we see you and we are here to work with you. For those of you who are faculty members and public health professionals, this is a call to use all our professional tools in order to achieve health equity. This is our responsibility. For those of you who are students in our college and other colleges across the nation, now I'm talking to you. This event is for you. It was planned with you in mind Take ownership of it. Never stay silent in front of justice. In the words of the writer and activist, Abraham Finkelstein, silence institutionally is about control, but individually is about complicity. Speak up. Silence is still to this day equal death. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the Dean of the University of Kentucky College of Public Health. This event will not be possible without the support of Dr. Donna Arnett. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rafael, and thank you, Katie Cardarelli, as well, for organizing this amazing event. The COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare the health inequities that exist in our country, particularly the SX disease burden and mortality risk in African-American and Latinx communities. Minority members of these communities have been especially hard hit in this pandemic. Our health system has essentially been rendered a non-system for protecting the health and well-being of our population in general and minority communities in particular. The downstream consequences of our COVID-19 public health mitigation efforts have also been particularly hard in minority communities. So what are the causes of these dramatic differences in COVID-19 risk and mortality in minority communities in the US? This pandemic has put a spotlight on health inequities that have existed in the US for decades. One of the COVID-19 risk factors that has received recent attention is structural racism. Now today we have an expert, Dr. Gilbert Gee, who's going to be talking to us about structural racism and the rules and relations of inequality. But I wanted to briefly introduce the topic and just provide one example that I think can help put this um, tremendous risk factor in light. So what is structural racism? Well, broadly speaking, it includes macro level systems, social forces, institutions, ideologies, and processes that interact to reinforce inequities among racial ethnic minorities. Essentially, structural racism is a system that structures opportunities for communities. Some may be beneficial, others could be harmful. And for those of you who may be new to this concept of structural racism, let me give you an example that will make it very clear. Between 1935 and 1940, 
the Homeowners Loan Corporation used data and evaluations that were organized by local real estate professionals. These professionals included lenders, developers, and real estate appraisers in every city. And that group assigned grades to residential neighborhoods that reflected their mortgage security. And this mortgage security score would then be visualized on color-coded maps, such as the one you see now on your screen. The green areas were deemed a minimal risk for banks and other mortgage lenders when they were determining who should receive loans and which areas of the city were considered safe investments. Those receiving the lowest grade were colored red and were considered hazardous. Conservative responsible lenders would refuse to make loans in these areas or only on a conservative basis. The Homeowners Loan Corporation created area descriptions to help organize the data that they used to assign these grades. Among that information was the neighborhood's quality of housing, the recent history of sale and rent values, these things we would expect for those of us who have gone through mortgage loan applications. But crucially, and so fundamental to the topic of our um, symposium today, the racial and ethnic identity and class of residents that served as, as in that neighborhood served as the basis of that neighborhood's grades. These maps and their accompanying documentation help set the rules for nearly a century of real estate practice. And these grades were a tool that we've come to term redlining. People in these redlined areas found it difficult or impossible to access mortgage financing and become homeowners. Redlining directed both public and private capital to white and non-immigrant families and away from African-American and immigrant families. As home ownership was the most significant means of intergenerational wealth building in the United States in the 20th century, these redlining practices from 80 years ago have created long-term wealth inequities that we still see today. This history of government policies that contribute to inequality is the prime example, I'm sure one of many, of structural racism. If you want to explore this in more depth, Google um, mapping inequality and redlining so on the screen today, you'll see an example from Lexington. And for those of you who are familiar with Lexington, um, you'll see our areas that are red line and importantly, those that are green. For example, this is the highly desirable area called Chevy Chase in Lexington. As you dig deeper into the language that was used back between 1935 and 1940 to describe these red line areas in every city, you will see such language as infiltration of these regions with lower grade or undesirable population. Here are some specific examples. The infiltration of Negroes informed the grades in neighborhoods in Birmingham, Youngstown, Cleveland, Los Angeles, and Chicago. And as I mentioned, it isn't restricted just to minorities. The infiltration of Jews in Los Angeles or the infiltration of Italians in Kansas City were also mentioned. But the key point is these infiltrations always lower the grades in these area neighborhoods, making it impossible to secure a mortgage or to enable home ownership. So let me return just a moment to the fundamental question we came here, I came here today to discuss. What are the reasons for these large COVID-19 ethnic disparities that can be attributed to structural racism? Well, we know that the risk of exposure to COVID, to the coronavirus, is greater because of residential segregation that resulted from these practices. We have less social distan distancing possible, more intergenerational, multi-generational households, and we're more likely to live in concentrated high poverty tracts if you're a minority. These environments are more harmful. Black and Latino neighborhoods have fewer parks, fewer green spaces than white neighborhoods, and fewer safe places to exercise or play. These communities are also more likely to be exposed to environmental hazards, such as lead. Because of their increased population density, the spread of communicable diseases happens more frequently. They have lower access to healthy goods, such as fewer grocery stores, um, and often the groceries are more expensive. And they're less likely to have jobs allowing them to work from home. For example, non-Hispanic African-Americans disproportionately occupy 
the top nine essential occupations. As a result of all of this, these populations have more underlying health conditions that expose them to greater mortality risk from COVID-19. They also have less healthcare access and quality of care. The lower wage jobs offer no healthcare benefit often, and there are fewer providers within these communities. Hopefully, Dr. G and our other distinguished panelists, Dr. Foley, Love, and Burrell can help us to understand how to address this fundamental question. How do we break the cycle of inequity that leads to a healthier trajectory for our underrepresented group? We know some of the answers, but this is a challenging problem that's going to take multiple strategies, and it's at the heart of what public health does best. These answers will be informed by geography, social determinants of health, and personalized risk profiles. We know that the best solutions will be powered by interventions that come from within communities. And we know from our own work in Kentucky that community-driven solutions yield better results. But this wicked problem is also going to require policy research so that we understand the strategies that work best to address big needs like housing and transportation. And these solutions will require a sustained investment and a long-term policy agenda, not one that just lasts four years with one president to the next. Here at the College of Public Health at the University of Kentucky, our mission is to build health champions. As public health scientists and educators, let us, all of us, be part of this solution. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Katie Cardarelli, Senior Assistant Provost for Faculty Affairs and Associate Professor of Health, Behavior, and Society in the College of Public Health. Katie, I turn it to you. Thank you, Dean Arnett, and good morning, everyone. Let me also extend my welcome to this, our inaugural symposium focused on racial and health inequities in the United States. And I also want to specifically thank the College of Public Health for your sponsorship of today's event. The University of Kentucky has long been viewed as a leader nationally in health equity, focused primarily on rural and Appalachian populations. We're excited today to, to serve as a leader nationally in focusing on the important issue of structural racism and how we collectively as a public health community must address it together. We have three exciting speakers today, all of whom uh, I deeply respect, and I'm so excited that they have shared their time and expertise with us. And I am pleased to serve as your moderator for today. I'm going to introduce each speaker uh, prior to their talk, and we are going to hold our Q&A session to the end. However, I know that you'll have a lot of thoughtful questions, and please feel free to drop those questions into the Q&A box. And my, colleague, uh, my colleagues who are serving as moderators with me will help us to put those in a queue and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can at the Q&A session. I, I do want everyone to know that we are recording today's session and we will be emailing all of our participants a link to the recording which is housed on our YouTube channel. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker who is coming to us from the West Coast where it is very early in the morning, <laughs> Dr. Gilbert G. Dr. G is a professor of community health sciences at the Fielding School of Public Health at the University of California at Los Angeles. His research focuses on the social determinants of health inequities of racial, ethnic, and immigrant minority populations using a multi-level and life course perspective. A primary line of his research focuses on conceptualizing and measuring racism and in understanding how racism affects health. His research has, been, has received distinctions such as a Group Merit Award from the NIH, Scientific and Technical Achievement Awards from the EPA, the Delta Omega Award for Innovative Public Health Curriculum, and the Paul Cornley Award from the Health Activist. Dr. G was also the former editor-in-chief of the Journal of Health and Social Behavior. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to turn it over to our first panelist, Dr. Gilbert G. Thank you. 
dedicated uh, to research and help people find the meaning of life and why we have this life and living here. And we sort of focus on this kind of element of wanting to do something with our life and our lives and our lives in general. And so that's what we're about here today. So I want to take you on a trip across the country to Michigan. And it's like you know my dream of going to Michigan for a lot of different reasons. But I want to take you on a trip to Michigan to see what it's really like to be a native Michigander. So let's go to Kelly and Mary. Dr. G, I, I hate to interrupt you, but I, we're not hearing you. Make sure that you are unmuted. Dr. G, we are able to hear you quite faintly. Um, it may have to do with your choice of the microphone you have on there. Let's give this just a moment while you can adjust your audio. Do you possibly have headphones? Um, it's I'm, I'm going to make the suggestion that while Dr. G um, kind of adjusts his audio, that we move on to our second speaker just to keep us moving here. And Dr. G, I know Allison will work with you on that. So Dr. Fullalove, you're up next. I'm going to introduce to you, Dr. Robert Fullalove is the Professor of Socio-Medical Sciences and the Associate Dean for Community and Minority Affairs at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University Medical Center. Dr. Fullalove has authored numerous articles in the area of minority health. He has served on the Board of Health Promotion and Disease Prevention at the IOM, the Institute of Medicine, and since 1996, he has served on five IOM study committees focused on issues such as substance abuse and addiction, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and damp indoor spaces and health. He was designated a National Associate of the National Academies of Science and was appointed to the National Advisory Committee on STD and HIV Prevention at the CDC, eventually becoming that committee's co-chair. He served on the National Advisory Council for the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine at the NIH. And since 2010, he has been teaching public health courses in six New York State prisons that are part of the Bard College Prison Initiative and serves as the senior advisor to the Bard Prison Initiative's public health program. Dr. Fullalove, it is my honor to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. And first question, can everybody hear me? All right. So good morning, everyone. I'm speaking to you from New York City. I think uh, beginning with me might be an appropriate way to start our conversation since, as I think all of you know, this city served as the epicenter for COVID-19 for a number of months. And with more than 200,000 cases, I think uh, it's fair to say that our burden of disease has been amongst the highest, not simply in the United States, but in the world. Um, let me go to the share screen and hope that this works as well. All right, so if that's visible, let me begin. You heard from the introduction that I've spent a substantial amount of time teaching public health courses in 
New York State prisons as part of the Bard Prison Initiative. This is part of a level of engagement with the role of, of mass incarceration in public health that at least for me goes back to the 1990s when I was concerned about the relationship between the very substantial numbers of folk who were in prison because of drug use, because of drug dealing, because of engagement with the drug using populations of the United States and the impact that having so many of them in prison was having on the HIV epidemic. Once again, at this point in the struggles of all of us in public health to make sense of the current pandemic, we suddenly discover that health disparities, ways in which we understand them, particularly with respect to mass incarceration, are part of the ways in which we understand the impact that COVID-19 is having on communities of color in the United States. I'm gonna be talking about mass incarceration. I'm gonna be talking about health disparities in communities of color, as will my co-panelists. But I'm also somebody who's been around for a while. So one of the ways in which I like to introduce this topic to students here at Columbia University is talk about history. It has been my experience in the 31 years that I've been teaching at Columbia, that increasingly graduate students in the United States have a very weak understanding of the role that history has played in so many of the dilemmas that we're facing right now as a nation. So I think if we're clear that one of the most vulnerable populations in the United States happens to be individuals who are locked up in jails or prisons. And we understand that part of what has made the problem in New York so much a focus of what we do in public health, it's literally because the large concentration of black and brown people in these settings, not just in New York, but nationwide, has a great deal to do with why in these facilities, we have some of the heaviest concentrations of COVID-19 anywhere in the United States. I think 16 of 17 centers that have the highest concentration of this virus are prisoner jail settings. That these places have a large population of vocal color means that uh, some of what we need to understand is where all of this came from. I'm very interested in talking about the existence of what will be described as a carceral society. A carceral society is one for which mass incarceration, engagement with the police, engagement with the courts has become a dominant feature of life in many communities. If we in medicine and public health are gonna be successful in our efforts to deal with health disparities in general, but COVID-19 in particular, we need to be aware of how much in this nation, being locked up, being a part of the population engaged in mass incarceration is one of the major social determinants of health with which we should be concerned. There are few social conditions in our country that have the dramatic impact on life that this particular phenomenon, being locked up, being engaged with the courts or the police has on life in this nation. Did you know that there are some 77 million citizens of this country who have what's called a rap sheet, a record that they've had some kind of encounter with the police or the courts? It's a way of sort of describing that although we often focus on the number of people who are behind bars, the extent of the social damage that is done as a result of having an engagement with the police or the courts is considerable. And it has a great deal to do with one's ability to get social services, one's ability to get housing, one's ability to have a job. 86% of all corporations in the United States will do a background check to see whether or not you've been arrested, done time in prison, or whether or not you are currently on probation. If we understand how much that limits the social movement of individuals in this country, no surprise that this kind of limitation is gonna have a direct impact on health. One of the ways in which we've tried to sort of understand this, once again, is through the, the veil of history. And I describe it as a veil because it is not, not very well known. We at the Mailman School of Public Health were part of a national movement that tried to examine in the year 2019, what had happened to this nation in the 400 years since 1619, when the first Africans were brought to these shores in Jamestown, Virginia, to begin this country's rather tragic experimentation with slavery. We describe this problem in American history as not simply affecting people of African descent. 
we've noted that in a nation that has its, its principal motto, all men are created equal, to have 245 years of this history bound up when this democratic nation held people in bondage meant that we're looking at a way in which our thinking about who we are as a democracy is not met by the nature of our actions. This kind of cognitive dissonance is what we call the ecology of inequality, because we think this dissonance not only impacts Black people, it impacts immigrants, all communities of color, women, workers. In many respects, that we maintain this notion that we are a society de dedicated, excuse me, to democratic principles is simply not expressed in the nature of our actions. And the fact that we don't really understand very much about slavery, that it is poorly taught in our schools, leads, for example, to us understanding why it's so important to talk about this at this point in 2020. For example, uh, it's very clear because I, I'm very interested in speaking about the history of slavery and how that impacts mass incarceration. It's very interesting to point out that in a survey done by the Southern Poverty Center, in 2018, it was discovered when high school seniors were asked, what's the major cause of the Civil War? What was responsible for one of the bloodiest episodes in the history of the United States? Only 8% could identify slavery as one of the major drivers of that particular historic tragedy. I'm very clear that if we're to understand how slavery impacted much of this nation's history. If we're to see how slavery connects rather directly to mass incarceration, the first place to begin our understanding and exploration of this history has to be with the Constitution of the United States. Put together in the late 1700s and the 1780s, it's very clear that there were three articles of the Constitution that basically established slavery as an integral part of the structure of what would ultimately become the United States of America. What were those uh, three articles? Well, the first one, Article One, Section Two, was the rather well-known one because this is the one that created the national census. This was the article that basically set up the foundations for the creation of a representative democracy. And it did so by basically saying, let's do a count of the American people so that we can engage in a principle in peopling our legislative bodies. That observes the whole notion that for every one person, there's gonna be a vote and that represent representation should be based on that principle. So how are we gonna do the count? Well, as this article points out, we're gonna count all free persons, but we're gonna make some specific exclusions when it comes to those who are bound to service. They're gonna be counted as three fifths of a person, which, in a lot of historical documents seems to suggest that we are imposing on those who were enslaved this notion that they were less than human. It's probably less that and much more the notion that human beings are here being counted as property. They are not going to be able to vote, but they are going to be uh, assessed, if you will, as a way of understanding the riches that were present in each of the 13 colonies that had been created as a way of uh, developing what would ultimately become the US. The idea that uh, this seals the fate of enslaved persons as property is continued in Article 1, Section 9, where it's noted that the slave trade will end in the year 1808. It is not to say that slave trading between Africa and the New World didn't continue. But when it did, the Constitution made it clear that a tax would be imposed on every body that was brought from Africa to these shores that would amount to essentially $10. Once again, slaves as property. Slaves as an essential element of what would ultimately be the workforce that would make the South so prosperous at the beginning of the 19th century. Article 4, Section 2 is the one that basically establishes the Runaway Slave Act. It points out that in states where slavery is legal, should someone bound to service find their way to the North, find their way to states where slavery was not the law of that particular state, 
they are still considered property and must be returned to the party to whom service or labor may be due. A lot of people understand that uh, as a result of all this, when Abraham Lincoln in 1863 signed the Emancipation Proclamation, it was a way of ensuring that the South, which was then in a state of rebellion, in the Confederate States would no longer have access to slave labor. So the emancipation set the stage for what would ultimately be the end of the Civil War, but it did not end slavery. In places like Missouri, which were not a part of the Confederacy, the Emancipation Proclamation had no real sway. What did turn out to be important was Article 13, the amendment of the amendment, the 13th Amendment, excuse me, which basically ended slavery for all intents and purposes in the United States, but with one significant exception. And what's the exception? It's for anyone who's been convicted of a crime. In that instance, your rights as a free person, what would normally be the end of slavery, for you would be something that would begin. It's a way of sort of understanding how the 13th Amendment may have ended slavery in the United States, but it left a void in the Southern labor markets. For hundreds of years, the South had depended on free labor. All of a sudden it was deprived of that resource. So what was it gonna to do to make sure that its agrarian economy post the Civil War could be maintained? Well, it became clear that what was established was the beginnings of a criminal justice system, which took crimes like loitering or vagrancy and made them punishable by indeterminate sentences that could endure for a substantial period of time. This became the labor force that was largely created, largely maintained by the 13th Amendment's exception. Here's what it looked like in the state of Mississippi. This is somewhere around 1900. This is Parchment Farm. Uh, a farm that, for those of you who are old enough to recall the blues of the 1920s, was often sung of as one of those places where men like this lived in the despair that you see so clearly mirrored on their faces. This is the beginning of mass incarceration in the United States. And this is what it looks like now. I believe this photo was taken somewhere outside of Bessemer, Alabama. You all are uh, below the Mason-Dixon line. Perhaps what you see in many of your travels through the South are roadsides where you'll see men like this shackled together, often uh, responsible for maintaining the highways and making sure that they're clean. It's a way of sort of understanding that this is the real beginning in this country of mass incarceration. And this is what it looks like in settings like the prisons that I have been working in, in upstate New York. A lot of people have a notion that to be locked up in a prison is to be locked up in a cell where social distancing at this moment in our struggles with COVID-19 is gonna be easy to maintain. That might be true of movie treatments of death row where many prisoners are waiting their execution. But in most facilities, in most incarceration facilities in the United States, this kind of dormitory congregate setting is exactly why these institutions have become such an intense concentration of COVID-19 patients. The numbers continue to soar. We don't really have accurate numbers because many systems, many states simply do not test all the inmates to determine what's the presence of the virus in these places. And as a consequence, what we know is rather well conveyed by this photograph that wherever they happen to exist in dormitory settings where congregate living is the reality, this virus is gonna to continue to spread. The notion that you're looking at more than just a dormitory, you're also looking at a schema in which the majority of the individuals that you're seeing here are black or brown. There's another way of sort of understanding why COVID-19 prisons and the impact that this pandemic is having on communities of color is in fact so extreme. We're looking at ways in which people cycle from one environment to another. 
It's one of the reasons why, beginning in 1972, we suddenly see in the United States an incredibly sharp rise in the use of mass incarceration as a way of dealing with social control. Many of you have heard this statistic before, and it certainly bears repeating now. As a nation, we house 5% of the population of the world, but 25% of all the prisoners doing time in a carceral facility anywhere in the world are right here in the United States. Put in other terms, 25% of the world's prisons, prisoners, excuse me, are doing time in facilities like the ones you just saw in that photo. Understand, this is why we see prisons, mass incarceration, being someone who has a felony conviction as a major driver of the social determinants of health. Our prisons are largely housing a population that is roughly 60% non-white. Black and brown folks are there in great numbers. As is pointed out in this slide, one in every 13 black males, age 13 to 30, excuse me, to 34, was in prison in 2011. There are estimates that one out of every three African-American males born in the year 2001 will do at least one year in a prison in his lifetime. Understand that, as is pointed out here, in 2010, 3% of all adults and 10% of African-Americans were currently or previously doing time in prison. These rates vary from about 1% uh, to about 12% but they represent a way in which wherever you see prison facilities, you are very likely to see a heavy concentration, a very significant population of people of color, both men and women. 23% of African-Americans and adults had a conviction of a felony that was a result of their having to be either in prison, on probation or under the supervision of the courts. 33% of African-American males in the year 2010 were living with the consequences of having such a felony conviction as part of their records. The burden of felony convictions is substantial. If we understand that one in three African-American adults who are dealing with the problems that are associated with having a felony conviction will also have an inability to vote. 48 states out of the 50 in the United States basically bar anyone with a felony conviction from voting. It's very clear that if you are someone who is formerly incarcerated, your chances of getting a job are very, very low. It's also clear that uh, if you are someone in a state where your social services are very limited, if you are someone who's done time in prison, that means that your access to training opportunities and educational opportunities will be substantially reduced. Not mentioned here is the fact that in many states, if you are someone who's been convicted of a felony, you can't live in Section 8 housing. You are not eligible to enter federally financed public housing pro projects. Here in New York City, a substantial portion of the men who are homeless are folk who are homeless literally become military because they are living with a felony conviction that bars them from access to normal sources of obtaining an apartment for obtaining a home. It's also the case that uh, there are about 600,000 people who are released from a state prison every year. A substantial number of them will go back to the communities where they were incarcerated. These are largely poor communities of color that are heavily policed so that the likelihood that in a heavily policed neighborhood, you may be seen doing something that violates the conditions of your parole means that you go back. It is one of the reasons why recidivism, the rate at which people go back to prison after having been released in the United States hovers somewhere around 75%. That is to say roughly three out of every four persons released from prison will be back in prison within the spate of six to seven years. And when they are at home and they're in poor communities of color that have limited opportunities to provide them with the services or with the jobs that will keep them out of harm's way, their going back to prison becomes almost inevitable. 
It is estimated that some 50% of the folk who are currently doing time in a state or federal prison are folk who did not necessarily commit a new crime. They violated the conditions of their parole. One of the ways of describing how the person who is suffering most as a result of having had a felony conviction can be the individual person doing time. It can be that person's family, or it can be the community where they ultimately have to return. It's one of the ways in which we try to understand that carceral citizenship isn't simply a problem of the individual. It is a problem of the communities that must provide the services that have to be in place if folk are gonna be successful once they're home at staying home. But there's no question, but if we think about what has happened in the United States since the 1970s, when mass incarceration became part of the way in which we imposed all sorts of social controls, largely around the issue of drugs. The war on drugs has had an enormous amount to do with the larger outsized nature of the prison population. If we understand that what we're looking at is an entirely different social arrangement where mass incarceration becomes one of the ways in which you manage the problems that are created by unemployment and poverty, you'll see that we are a nation that has been transformed by the use of prisons as a way of dealing with some of society's most pressing problems. The idea that carceral citizenship is a social arrangement that is being produced by our efforts at doing time control means once again that we're not just looking at the lives of individuals who are locked up, we're looking at the communities that are impacted by their being gone. It represents a form of community loss. How many children in many poor communities are growing up in settings in which their lack of access to their adult parents has had a dramatic impact on the nature of their education, their socialization, and their prospects for success in the future. The loss of these adults, adults who are really necessary for helping usher children into adult roles in society has an impact that is difficult to measure, but it is something that is seen dramatically in many of the ways in which our social service indicators that describe how much the burden of folks being lost is changing the way communities function. It becomes very, very clear that so much of what is happening in poor communities of color may be the result of the indirect forces that are put in play when so many adults are no longer present to function in the community and to function in ways that support the lives of young people. Here's one way of sort of understanding that it comes from some of my colleagues on the main campus at Columbia University. So the question becomes, what's a million dollar block? Well, what you're looking at is a map of New York City. And what you're looking at in red are places where were you to go around block by block and look at the places where substantial numbers of folk on the block used to live. And I say used to live because they're no longer there they're doing time in a prison in upstate New York. If you were to multiply the number of folk on that block who are no longer there by $60,000, which is the cost in New York State of keeping someone incarcerated for a year, what you would produce is this pattern, a pattern where we're spending $1 million on a block that is not gonna provide them with education, that is not gonna provide them with better housing, which is not gonna provide them with healthcare. No, that million dollars, those million tax dollars are being spent to keep someone behind bars. What's really important in the city of New York is to know how much in the places where you see these red dots, the places where you're gonna see red blocks are also the places where in this map, the dark spots indicate sources of concentrated health disparities in the form of poverty, deaths related to AIDS, deaths related to di diabetes, and in other maps you'd see similar kinds of depictions of all of the major conditions that are lumped under the term health disparities. And you'd see that once again, they map beautifully onto what we understand to be this pattern of million dollar blocks. Once, a, once again, it is a way of understanding how mass incarceration is driving the health of these communities in ways that are difficult to measure, 
but which become very obvious when depicted on a map like this. So I have given talks like this where I go on and on and on describing not just what's happened to the population that's in prison. I spend a lot of time looking at jails. One could talk about the school to prison pipeline. But I think what this does is give the sense that if you were to understand the way in which mass incarceration operates, you'd be tempted to say that folks in the communities that are heavily impacted by this set of policies, by this set of conditions, are all victims. What's the problem with presenting a population like this as victims? Well, you don't do very much with a victim other than provide them with charity. I think what's missing here is the notion that there has to be some agency in which we try to understand, well, what's happening to the folk who are caught up in this system of carceral citizenship? What is it that can be done to make them actors in the situations that create health disparities and provide them with such challenges to maintaining their presence in normal society? Well, if you think about agency as something that we are empowering people to do, where because of what we provide them, they are now able to act in their own defense. They're now able to act to promote their own benefits and their own goods. It's one of the reasons why, at least for me, the Bard Prison Initiative has become a shining example of what it is we have to do all over, not just in the services that are provided by public health to change the conditions that I've just described. The Bard Prison Initiative was established, as you can see in the slide, in 1999. It offers associate arts degrees and BA degrees in six prisons in New York State. In 2019, it had granted nearly 550 degrees to BPI participants and had more than 500 students per year enrolled in college classes. Some of you may be aware of the fact that there is a film that was produced by Kenneth Burns that is currently available on Netflix, which is called College Behind Bars, which is a dramatic presentation of the Bard Prison Initiative. It has been nominated for two Emmys, and it's one of the ways in which you can sort of get a glimpse of what it's like to be in settings like that, where this notion that through education, we provide people with agency to change the direction of their lives, it's where you get to see this in dramatic, often inspiring terms. And let me just sort of commend the watching of that film to all of you, since it's free, seems to me almost everybody's on Netflix these days. And it's one of the ways in which you can see exactly how what I'm describing in these slides actually looks like in real life. Since I have been engaged in teaching public health courses in three of these facilities, I've now been able to have my efforts joined by a number of faculty at New York University, Columbia University, and the City University of New York who are part of offering a public health concentration to, these, to folks in these three facilities. We're very clear that part of what happens with all of this is that if we give folk training in public health, if they are to return to New York City in particular, they will discover that working in public health is often working in what we describe as a felony free environment. It means that the fact that you have a felony conviction is not going to limit you from doing the work of public health that has to occur in many communities of color in this city. What is it that these folk are in a position to do? Well, one of the things that haunts the medical establishment here in the city is the fact that there are a substantial number of folk who have had health care in prison who do not access health care when they are home. Why don't they do that? Because at some point in time in the provision of a health history. They're going to have to say things like, well, uh, yeah, I, I, I got treated for diabetes, but my records are part of the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision. At which point the receptionist or the person who's the health care worker suddenly has a dull look shading their eyes. And the person who is there suddenly begins to understand that they have just stopped being a patient, they're now considered to be a problem. I've had any number of folk who have returned from prison tell me, doc, I can get treated badly almost everywhere. 
But to be treated badly in a doctor's office or in a hospital, oh no, I'd rather die. And as a consequence, many, many folk who are struggling with a variety of illnesses, especially chronic diseases, may wait and delay their care so that when they finally do show up, it will be in an emergency room. A condition that we might have been able to control has now become chronic. And the perspective, the perspective that we will have and the likelihood that we will be able to provide them with the best care available has now gone down substantially. The idea that folk who are trained in public health can serve as a bridge between those populations, the populations that are reluctant to seek primary care, and can serve as a bridge to healthcare facilities where they have the task of not only making the access easier, they're also helping to train people on how to provide culturally appropriate care to individuals like this. So it turns out to be a two-way street. As credible messengers, they do the job of convincing folk, yes, access to health care is yours and it can be provided. And then they're also doing their best to make sure that when the provision is present and when healthcare workers are doing their job, that they're doing so in a fashion that is appropriate for all the needs and all the problems that folk who are returning from prison are inevitably going to have to confront. One would think that this would be something that would be widely adopted all over the United States. One of the reasons you'd want to do this is that the recidivism rate that I cited earlier, approaching 75% in the United States for almost all folk who are returning home from state or federal prison, is contrasted rather dramatically with the fact that, as is noted in this slide, recidivism rates for folk who have gotten a college degree on the inside from this program hovers at a little less than 3%. When Governor Cuomo tried to argue before the state legislature that this was an appropriate return on investment, citing that if it costs us $60,000 a year to keep someone locked up, and we're gonna have 40, to 45% of them return within four to five years? Doesn't a program that costs us only $5,000 that provides somebody with a working degree that will dramatically improve their likelihood of being employed once they're home, doesn't that seem like the kind of investment that the state would make? Well, in New York State, as is probably true in the rest of the United States, this is a hard sell. We as a nation, are not at all predisposed to do things on behalf of those who have committed crimes. We don't want to coddle prisoners. Name a place in the United States where you can be elected to some sort of office based on a plank where you argue, I'm going to be soft on crime. So the rather predictable result of Governor Cuomo's attempt to get more state support for the Barred Prison Initiative pretty well fell flat on its face. When a lot of people pointed out, look, Governor, are you kidding? I've got so many people who are part of my constituency who are struggling to send their kids to college. And all of a sudden you're telling me that somebody commits a crime, goes to prison, and they can have access to a free education that might be provided by an Ivy League professor? No, Governor Cuomo, we're not gonna do that. It's one of the ways in which, although we often say that economics drives a lot of our thinking, Economics drives a lot of what we think should be a part of public policy. In some instances, when it comes to this area, we're much more about punishment than we are about rehabilitation. And now that we're struggling with COVID-19 in many of these facilities, where governors are very loath to try and create the conditions in prisons, perhaps by releasing folks early, perhaps by changing the manner in which we currently house individuals in these settings. The fact that this often is not done is because governors worry that, yes, I might be doing something that is appropriate for this pandemic, but oh, the political consequences I will suffer if I appear to be coddling prisoners. Coddling prisoners in the midst of a pandemic is pretty much what we have to do if we are to reduce the likelihood that these reservoirs of infection won't ultimately impact life not just in the communities where the prison is housed, but life in the communities to which people who are being released from jail or prison will return. But that is a topic I think that we can discuss later on in the question and answer setting. I'm simply pointing out 
that what you see in the failure to support the financing of the Bard Prison Initiative by the state is part of what we see represented in the thinking of governors and other state bodies that are simply not able to act directly or purposefully or impactfully on dealing with reducing the risk that COVID-19 creates for COVID, excuse me, for congregate settings like our jails and prisons. But one of the ways in which I also like to describe how this kind of approach to providing agency has really succeeded for us here at Columbia is to describe Rich Camara. Rich Camara was uh, arrested at age of 16 when he brought a prison, uh, brought, excuse me, a pistol to his school. The Daily News, one of the big newspapers here in New York, did a big story about the fact that this young 16-year-old who was later um, identified as a member of the Latin Kings was somebody who sort of represented the struggles we're often having with schools, having to do with the presence of violence there. Well, that arrest started, as you'll see here in this slide, a 10-year journey in and out of prisons in a variety of settings. I met him at Woodbourne State Correctional Facility in Sullivan County. And I was very proud of the degree to which having become fascinated with our descriptions of what might be possible with a degree in public health. In 2017, he graduated with a master's of public health from the Mailman School in epidemiology and has since his graduation been working for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. He is one of a number of VPI graduates who now work for the New York City Department of Health. And he is one of three students who gotten a graduate degree in public health from Columbia, which was the occasion for us saying, if you think about what happens if we in public health begin to invest in this kind of training in carceral settings, part of what we get to produce are those credible messengers to make it possible for us to work with large populations of folk who are home from prisons, who are what we describe as returning citizens, but who are struggling to enjoy all that they should be able to get as returning citizens when it comes to access to healthcare or other social services. BPI graduates demonstrate that they can be powerful change agents, give them the tools to do the work that we know has to be done in poor communities that are struggling with health disparities, and I think what you're going to see is someone who has the likelihood of making contributions that are going to be lasting. We've written this up in an article that appears in a special supplement to the American Journal of Public Health. This article was authored by three of my students, three that I taught in prison, who have now graduated from the Mailman School of Public Health. And they give us a sense that when it comes to thinking about solutions for the future, when it comes to making it possible for us to really do the work that's going to have to be done to sell a vaccine for COVID-19 in many mistrusting communities of color. As credible messengers, they may be the folk who will do the job that is necessary. I want to end with the notion that what you're looking at is a way in which we can envision the work that is done in BPI, the work that is done specifically around promoting public health education and public health principles, is an idea whose time has come and worth being discussed and deliberated amongst uh, all of us at a point when we're done with the presentations and are really trying to think about what's the way forward for the future. Thank you. Let me stop there. Thank you, Dr. Fullalove, for your compelling presentation, um, for describing to us the ecology of inequality. You know, I'm really struck by the lack of understanding in this nation of our history, particularly among young people, which you noted. Um, and I'm also, you know, mindful that the framing of our history in our schools is largely uh, provided from a white male lens, which I think is, a, is important for us to acknowledge. Um, I also appreciate how you, you were able to share with us um, through our history, you know, the, the connection between slavery and our current, more current um, crisis of mass incarceration, which clearly is exacerbating the disproportionate COVID infection and death um, in our prisons um, and disproportionately affecting um, populations of color. And finally, I, I wanna thank you for highlighting the Bard Prison Initiative 
And I'm particularly heartened um, by the availability of public health as, as a concentration uh, for those individuals. And finally, I, I just wanna note, I saw on one of your slides, you noted the Equal Justice Initiative, um, which I'm a, a great admirer of. And, and for those of you all that are not familiar with the Equal Justice Initiative, you might take a look at it. Um, so we're gonna turn at this point um, to Dr. Gilbert G to see if uh, we were able to um, correct some of the sound challenges that we had before. Dr. G, can you, um, can you speak? Let's see if we can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? Is it better? Yes, okay, yes, good. We, can hear you. we can hear you. So I'm not gonna reintroduce you fully, just remind people that Dr. Gilbert G is a professor of community health sciences at the Fielding School of Public Health at UCLA. And uh, I'm mindful it's just now eight o'clock in Los Angeles. <laughs> so thank you for, for getting through all of these challenges and I'll turn it over to you, Dr. G. All right, thank you. Um, okay, let's see, can you, you can see my slides, I hope. Okay. Okay, yeah, so I'll, I'll try to speed through this. Um, sorry for the tech challenges. 2020 is turning into quite the doozy. Okay, so today I wanna to focus on structural racism, COVID, and I also wanna talk a bit about the Asian American experience. I wanna begin uh, with 20, Healthy People 2020, which as you know, is the nation's health planning document and the reduction of health uh, disparities was one of the major goals of Healthy P People 2020 and continues to be a major goal of Healthy People 2030. Um, what's important about this is that it is really the focus on historical and contemporary injustices. And in order to talk about injustice and in order to talk about equity in the uh, eyes of uh, Paula Braveman and many others is we really need to focus on social justice. But we can't talk about social justice without talking about racism. And as we talk about racism, we need to understand that racism occurs at multiple levels. And certainly there's been a lot of sustained scientific interest in the issue of racism from many important scientific bodies, as well as many scholars, uh, including many of the people on this panel who I've admired uh, for many years. But as you can see here, there have been reports from the Surgeon General's office, many reports from the National Academies of Science, from NIH, AJPH, uh, uh, you know, the American Journal of Public Health and many other uh, institutions and agencies. Now what's important here, and going back to, for example, uh, the, uh, the work of Carmichael and Hamilton is really the idea that racism operates at multiple levels. Most of the time, you know, when we talk about racism, we are thinking about hate crimes and things of that nature, which are certainly important, but hate crimes, microaggressions and whatnot are relatively easy to observe, but they're really the tip of the iceberg. And what's harder is to see the structural racism that's out there in society, but we really need to think about this from a multi-level and life course perspective. And as uh, Dr. Fulalove illustrated very uh, eloquently, we got to think about all these different institutions, education, uh, prisons, uh, and health all working together uh, over time. And we understand that health is produced at multiple levels. So for example, the work of Bronfram Brenner, many of you have seen this, you know, we understand that the health of a person is also related to their family, to their schools, neighborhoods, uh, the laws of the land, culture, the economic conditions of uh, their society and so forth. So with that, we can start to take a look in public health with the tools that we have on, for example, how prisons are related to mortality as illustrated by our prior speaker. And we also understand that it's connected to another system related to policing and to the courts, but it's also connected to education and so forth, right? And it's also connected to employment. And as we start to connect the dots across these various institutions, we understand that it's a very complex system that we live in, right? And so this is a slide from Barbara Reskin where she really talks about using a system science approach to understanding uh, race relations in the United States. And I think this idea translates very well to really making um, inroads in thinking about structural racism. Now, Derek Bell complicates our understanding of this because for example, he has a very famous quote 
which is even those Herculean efforts that we hail as successful were produced no more than temporary peaks of progress, short-lived victories that slide into irrelevance as patterns adapt in ways that maintain uh, uh, white dominance. So basically what's going on here is the idea that even with the civil rights movement, even with desegregation of hospitals and neighborhoods and whatnot, those reforms make somewhat relatively small lasting impressions on the racial dominance that we have in the United States. And I think part of that is really not really paying close attention to the structure writ large. So here is one way to think about uh, racism operating at multiple levels. The individual level is kind of, you know, the hate crimes, microaggressions and whatnot. And those, don't get me wrong, those are important. The institutional level are the institutions that serve us. You know, these are governmental agencies, this is healthcare, this is um, education and so forth. And so you can kind of illustrate that by what's shown here, which is Buckminster Fullerene, or it's essentially carbon 60, a soccer ball made out of carbon atoms. Each red dot represents an institution. So each red dot is like housing or education, prison and so forth. But now think about a soccer ball. If you kick that ball, you may have a momentary deflection. There's a little dent in the ball, okay? But at the end of the day, the ball reverts back to its natural state of being a sphere. And the reason that happens is because any point on that ball, any point on this soccer atom is reinforced by the connections to other carbon atoms. In other words, other institutions can pick up the slack of doing racism. So if we do an intervention on housing, we see maybe a momentary deflection, that work of maintaining white supremacy ends up being picked up, the slack of that being picked up by another institution, in this case, mass incarceration and so forth, right? And so what we need to do, I think, is really focus on the connections of these institutions across one another. And so for me, this kind of buckyball analogy is sort of one way to think about it and really forces us to think about, you know, what are the rules that maintain the dominance? What are the rules and practices across institutions that allow them to, you know, help each other out? Okay. Now, having said that, I'm gonna pivot a little bit here and I'm gonna talk about what's going on with COVID and Asian Americans. <clears throat> So this rests on a much larger body of research that's been building over several decades, right? Where we understand that stereotypes and discrimination against individual persons is a real thing that affects people in the long term. And there's been a long body of growing research for many people like Tanae Lewis, uh, David Williams, and so forth that have really been documenting this. This is some data looking at the National Latino and Asian American study. And here you see that light Blue bars represents uh, Asian Americans who report very little discrimination. Dark blue bars represents more discrimination. And on the x-axis, you see uh, DSM-4 criterion anxiety disorders and controlling for things like age and so forth. You see that there's a dose response relationship. The greater the dosage of discrimination, the more likely people are to experience uh, uh, anxiety disorders. This is true for a variety of other problems like depression, heart disease, pain, and respiratory problems. And so these were some things that we identified in the literature many years ago. Um, and I think they have very important relevance today. You know, these experiences follow us to our modern day concerns about Asians and uh, COVID-19. And certainly you can see that there's been acts of resistance in the community where people are saying, we are not a disease. But it begs the question of why we're discriminating against Asians, why we're even discriminating against Asian health providers who are in this conundrum where they're putting their own lives at risk, treating patients with COVID, but at the same time facing discrimination by their neighbors, by their patients, and even by other providers. And as many of people, many of people have noted, you know, we're not only uh, finding an epidemic related to COVID, but also encountering an epidemic of hate. And so we wrote a little paper about this. Um, and what's important about this is really thinking historically about why today we are connecting races with diseases, right? And this goes back centuries. 
including the pseudoscience of phrenology, where people um, were trying to document the purported inferiority or superiority of certain races in order to justify slavery. Okay. And in, as part of this, physicians joined the chorus of other people uh, to try to document all these things. So for example, here is Sam, a quote from Samuel Cartwright. He was a physician who wrote, it's not only in the skin that a difference of color exists between the Negro and the white man, but in the membranes, the muscles, the tendons, and all the fluids and secretions. And what's it implied here is that people are black, not only from the outside, from their skin, but black on the inside. And there are basic physiological differences that are innate. And these things are largely unchangeable. This was the thinking at that time. But in, another important thing about Samuel Cartwright was he was not a kook. He was actually part of, you know, of the thinking of many, many physicians out there. Um, he would invent diseases like dreptomania, which is essentially the disease of a slave wanting to run away from their master. And others have joined that same idea. So Prince Morrow, for example, wrote, he was a dermatologist, that China has been the breeding place and nursery of pestilential diseases, color plague, as well as leprosy from time immortal. So there was this whole industry, in some ways, kind of foreshadowing uh, the work on health disparities, from, from, but from a much very different angle. And certainly there was a lot of work trying to, def, uh, to document, for example, how uh, all these diseases were coming from places like China and connecting Chinese people to things like leprosy, syphilis, trachoma, and so forth. And at least you think that those are ideas from a bygone era. This is an article published four years ago talking about Chinese restaurant syndrome, right? And so this is the idea that you go to a Chinese restaurant, you eat MSG, and then all these bad things happen to you. By the way, that MSG kind of work has been debunked um, and you might wanna check that out. But nonetheless, it's very interesting, this idea of connecting Chinese people, Chinese practices, and of course, not only the Chinese, but many others to various illnesses that perpetuates today. And so it's because we have this foundational knowledge. It's because there's been this long history of stereotyping and fears of things like Chinese food that, oh, you know, Chinese people eat bats and dogs and, you know, put your pets away that as we move into the current situation with COVID-19, it's an easy narrative because the ideas have never left us. It's an easy narrative to continue. And it translates to what people are seeing on the ground in various media sources, not only senators, but people uh, on the street saying things like, hey, what do you say we just drop an atomic bomb on these chinks and stop the coronavirus for good? So I want to present a little bit of research that's been uh, coming out. This is a study led by Tu Win that we uh, just got accepted literally this morning. <laughs> um, this is a study that shows negative sentiment on Twitter against Asian Americans. Okay, and so the the data pick up about two million tweets starting in November, so predating um, predating COVID. And what you can see here in this red bar is negative sentiment against Asian Americans is relatively flat until we get to March. And now we see this precipitous rise in negative uh, tweets against Asian Americans. And if we kind of zoom in on this, and by the way, I should also mention that when we look at the same graphs for African Americans, Latinos, and whites, we actually see a relatively flat line across this period. Now, what happened in March that really kind of maybe spurred some of this is, of course, Donald Trump on March 16th tweeted, the US will be a powerful, uh, will be powerfully supporting those industries like the airline and others that are particularly affected by the Chinese virus. And we will be stronger than ever before. Now, this is significant for several reasons. You know, first of all, of course, this is the president of the United States, but it's also using phrases like Chinese virus completely contradict what the World Health Organization, the CDC, and many other bodies have said. Do not use words like Chinese virus because they are stigmatizing. We have learned that from past pandemics. We have learned that from other phrases that we uh, attributed to um, groups like, um, like uh, the Spanish flu and so forth. 
we learned that we shouldn't do that. And in 2015, the WHO issued that policy statement. And then they issued you know, a, a warning in January and February not to use phrases like that and instead use COVID-19. So it was significant that our president tweeted using the words Chinese virus. Did that have any effect? Because some people argued, oh, it's just words. You know, we're just really talking about where people are and that's just a fact, okay? Well, let's take a look at this graph. So this is a study uh, led by Yulin Quen. Um, and th these are just some preliminary data, but I think it's important to show you. This zeroes in on March, okay? And what you see here in uh, on the, on the x-axis is time, so uh, March 9th, the week before, um, you know, uh, 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 pr the president's tweet. And here's an analysis of hashtags. And what you see here on the red line is COVID-19. So there's roughly maybe 100,000 or so tweets using COVID-19 uh, from our sample. And the blue line is Chinese virus. And you can see that Chinese virus is not the preferred term. Actually, COVID-19 is the hashtag that people uh, are mostly using, okay? Now, take a, oops, take a look at this. There's a sharp inflection point where you see a couple of things happening. First of all, there's a lot more action, a lot more discussion on Twitter uh, about you know, COVID, right? And you can see that there's a very large rise in tweets, uh, hashtags using COVID-19 as well as Chinese virus. You can also see that Chinese virus has overtaken COVID-19 as the preferred term. And oops, actually COVID-19 rose by 800%, but Chinese virus rose by 19,000%. It's an astronomical rise uh, right out of the atmosphere uh, in terms of usage of these terms. Now, if we take another look at this, but instead we're gonna look here at negative tweets. So these are tweets that say bad things like bomb China and so forth, um, you know, kill a chink and, and things like that. You can see that there's a rise in negative tweets actually associated with both terms, okay? We found that about, uh, you know, one in five COVID-19 hashtags were also associated with anti-Asian uh, sentiment. But more than half of Chinese virus tweets, um, hashtags were associated with negative sentiment. And you can see a huge rise in both of these terms, the rise of Chinese virus and a negative speech related to it, you know, rose by 17,000%. And to put that in absolute terms, we're talking about a rise from our sample of somewhere around 12,000 tweets to about a half million. Right, and if you think about it, there's a larger chorus, a larger volume of people saying hateful things against Asian Americans. And I think that's been correlated with why we have seen a rise in hate crimes around March 25th and 27th was when the FBI issued a report saying, be on the lookout, we are expecting a surge in anti-Asian hate crimes. Um, at the same time, a website was started, Stop AAPI Hate. Um, by uh, many members of the community and Russell Jung at uh, University, I mean, um, uh, San Francisco State University. You know, we had as a community, we needed to create a reporting database because the typical uh, venues of reporting to the police were not meeting the needs of the community members. And we can talk about that later. Um, but essentially what you found was in that period, right after, right in March, that there was a rise uh, right right after the website something API hate was uh, put out was established that within that one week there were about a 500 there were about 500 reports of anti Asian uh, discrimination that emerged in that period and again coinciding with the FBI prediction okay um, so based on the past experience of research showing that experiences of discrimination are associated with illness. We are also now seeing a new literature emerging uh, specific to COVID discrimination uh, being associated with poor health outcomes uh, amongst Asian Americans. And so, for example, there was a study that uh, just came out by Sinu Choi that looked at Korean Americans in the US. And according to their analysis, uh, discrimination against uh, Koreans related to COVID were a more important correlate of psychological distress than, say, income. 
And in a study by Teresa Chi uh, that's coming out in pediatrics where they looked at Chinese American uh, uh, parents and their children, they found that half of parents and kids uh, who are Chinese American were reporting discrimination uh, you know, uh, related to their ethnicity and related to COVID and that these things were related to poor health outcome, uh, to poor mental health outcomes. So this literature, I expect to keep continuing to grow as we move into the next period. What we're seeing is not new, right? This is not new because this continues a broad history of pathologizing people of color. It was used to justify slavery. It connects the institutions of medicine, science, health, to other institutions like prison, to law enforcement, and so forth. And this is a new, you know, connecting people because we saw, for example, in the early days, uh, you know, several years ago, the emergence of GRID, which was gay-related immune deficiency, which later was renamed AIDS. Right. We saw it with the Ebola virus, we saw it with SARS, and now, of course, we're seeing it with COVID. The thing is, if we don't change our foundational assumptions that races are connected biologically, intrinsically, then we won't change the pattern for the next pandemic that hits us after COVID uh, finally uh, subsides. Right. We have these assumptions that are built into how we do science and medicine. And as an example, if you think of Vital, which was a drug approved by the FDA for only a single race, Vital was only approved for African Americans. That kind of only makes sense if you believe that there's some underlying bio biological differences across races. It reinforces this idea that races are not political entities, but innate biological entities. This is seen in racial correction factors, where we adjust for values of, you know, excretions of various metabolites. It's part of this legacy of thinking that we, I think, really need to revisit nowadays. And a few places are starting to revisit those assumptions. Um, but it's not until we take a much harder look at that that we won't change our business as usual practice of associating races with diseases and new pandemics. And so that. With that, I will uh, want to thank you for your time and I welcome your questions in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. G. You clearly laid out um, the work that we have to do in public health. Um, I, I thank you for your timely and, and your compelling remarks, uh, particularly for emphasizing the interconnectedness between institutions as we think about potential options for intervention. But thank you also for highlighting um, the current heightened racism against Asians and Asian Americans, which is clearly perpetuated by the use of this stigmatizing language used by a lot of people, including elected officials and most notably uh, by our president. So um, we're going to turn now to our, our third speaker, Dr. Luisa Borrell. Dr. Borrell is the Distinguished Professor of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy at City University of New York. She is a social epidemiologist with a research interest on race and ethnicity, socioeconomic position, and neighborhood effects as social determinants of health. In addition, she has expertise in research methods and the analysis of large databases, including survey, census, and spatially linked data. Dr. Borrell has an extensive record in mentoring master and doctoral students, postdoc fellows, as well as junior faculty. It's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Luisa Borrell. Thank you. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. So good morning. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I am delighted to be here and foremost to provide you with my two cents on health inequities as relate to the Hispanic population. So in my brief time, I will provide you an overview of who we are, some insight on Hispanic health as relate to the Hispanic paradox, 
discuss the implication of COVID-19 for racial ethnic health inequity going forward, and conclude with a few actions and practice to address health inequity. So Hispanic is the fastest growing subgroup of the US population. As of July 2019, Hispanic comprised 18.5 of the population for a, a roughly 60 million people in the US. But before we go forward, it would be important to provide some context about how we get aggregated into a single category. The US census aggregated and shaped the racial ethnic categories according to a, a parallel sociopolitical discourse since the very first census in 1790. And as we know, the census is not a, a political or a political neutral institution. In fact, it is a government agency that uses the information collected to influence public policy and this implication on the population through distribution and allocation of power and resources. And if you haven't completed your census, please do, it. do. it's not too late. Before we, we describe the ethnicity category and how it was implemented, it will be important to describe different patterns or, or immigration that shape the category. The first group that was counting in the US for the Hispanic population was Mexican American. They were first counted as a, as a country of origin in the 1850 and then as a racial category in 1920. Then after that came the Puerto Rican wave in 1898. They became citizen in, in 1920, 17, more or less. And there was a, a flow of Puerto Rican from 12,000 in 1920 to approximately 900,000 in 1960. With the Cuban revolution and Fidel Castro in, in Cuba, the, uh, there was a big wave of immigration from Cuba and they were counted for the first time in 1970. Parallel to that, the White House mandated additional and Spanish origin self-identifier question to the US census. However, that mandate came too late and it was only added to the long form that was going to the 5% of the population. In 1976, the US Congress passed the public law 94311, which was a joint resolution that mandated the collection, analysis, and publication of data for a specific ethnic group, in this particular case, American or Spanish descent. And finally, in May 1977, required by Congress, the Office of Management and Budget issued the Directive 15, which basically sort of mandate a standard to collect and report information on racial, ethnic, statistic, and more than anything, sort of dictate the um, Hispanic origin question or the ethnicity question. So this is the question that we have seen for the past three, four census. And as pre this question precede the race question and ask Hispanic, what country or origin they are from. I particularly proudly respond and identify as Hispanic. But although we have been aggregated into a homogeneous group, there is tremendous variation within the category. And just to name a few, we can talk about ancestry, which is related to race, country of origin, nativity, its status, and socioeconomic position. So when it comes to the ancestry and race um, identification for the Hispanic population, because of the colonization history of Latin American, Hispanic are an admixture of African, Native American, and European population. The later results in the rainbow color that we see across the Hispanic population depending on the mix. And of course, this ratio varies within country and across country. So you can pick two, so you can select two Mexican American individual and one of them can look European and one of them can look Native American due to the proportion of this uh, founder population they have. The same is true for Puerto Rican. One can have a um, 
white appearance and another one can have a black appearance due to the mix of the founder population. Because of that mix, we are considered the any race identification. And within that, we the majority of Hispanic identify with the white uh, category and with the other or multiracial category. Although we are lumped into a group and are, we are joined with a common glue of the Spanish language, we are coming from at least 25 countries in Latin America. And cell identification is important because it's a sense of pride and an attachment to culture and values. And within that, the group that are um, overrepresented are Mexican, Puerto Rican, and Central America. Out of the 45 million foreign born in the US population, Hispanic represent 40, uh, 35%. And the vast majority of Hispanic have been in the US for over 10 years. And more than one third are US citizen. 70% are proficient on English and half of those uh, correspond to the uh, foreign foreign population, half of the, of the English proficiency are foreign, foreign uh, born. When it comes to education, when compared to the US population, Hispanic are 50% 50 50 more likely to have less than a high school and 50% 50, 50 less likely to have a bachelor degree or more. One in five Hispanic live in poverty and the same is true for health insurance, and this is post-ACA, before, before the Obamacare, this um, estimate was around 40%. So that brings us to the Hispanic paradox. The Hispanic paradox is based on the premise that Hispanic have lower socioeconomic status, as we, as we just saw, in the, as in the indicated by education, have less access to care than other group, but yet they have better outcome for uh, mortality, especially adults and, and infant mortality, even than um, the white population. This observation dated back to the early 1900s and it was mostly observed among Mexican American. So we can see here that when compared to white, Hispanic live three years longer and are 20% less likely to die or all cause and of the leading causes in the US, heart disease and cancer. And when it comes to infant mortality, their, their rate is similar to the white population. They are less likely to smoke, less likely to consume alcohol and have a lower probability of, of hypertension. However, they are more likely to be overweight and obese and more likely to have diabetes. Now, this is, the, uh, this is the health profile of the overall category. When we tease out within the different subgroup, Puerto Rican had the worst outcome and Cubans American had the best outcome. The later suggests that the Hispanic paradox doesn't apply to everyone. This is not a one size fit all. And this have implication going forward. So when the first cases of the COVID-19 surge in early, um, mid-February, early March, the virus was seen as the equalizer, meaning that some of these characteristics highlighted in the Healthy People 2020 as indicator of health disparity were not going to be um, determinants of who get the virus. But little we know, and quickly we learn, that the virus actually underscore the existing inequity beyond health in our society. So when CDC was CDC, before the DHSS uh, intervention, late July, the data was being provided by race and ethnicity and age adjustment estimate for hospitalization, death, et cetera. And very early it was 
observed, despite the fact that race wasn't, the, the data on race and ethnicity wasn't available for all cases, that there was a, a striking difference between the different racial and ethnic group and the Hispanic and black were carrying the heavy load of the virus. This was also true in New York City, which was the epicenter of the epidemic, as I've been saying before. But in addition to that, it's a diverse urban setting with a high proportion of minority. So if we look at the racial ethnic distribution of minority in New York City, and each one of this um, limitation indicates sick code, this can be literally overlay, overlay with a map of where the cases were happening in New York City. The same was true for service worker as minority are overrepresented and those uh, job. This is the way that the uh, CDC post DHS intervention is presenting the data. And as can be seen here, the minorities, especially American Indian, Black, and Hispanic, are the one carrying the greater toll of the disease. However, it is important to underscore that the raw data show that the high proportion of cases and death are literally an overrepresentation of what this population, like Black and Hispanic, represent in the US census. So for example, Hispanic represent 18.5 of the US population, but they represent 30% of the cases. Black comprise 13.4 of the, of the US population, but they represent 18.8 of the cases. And this is now, before July, at the end of, the, of July, or July the, represent, the representation of this group among the cases was over 30%. So what are the implications of COVID-19 for, for the current status of racial ethnic health inequity? So as I have been saying before, COVID-19 has worsened the existing inequity. And this is due to the risk possession minority were occupying before the virus. As we know, Racial ethnic minority population have a disproportionate burden or underlying comorbid conditions such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, asthma, HIV, morbid obesity, you name it. Social distance, the most basic way of preventing the virus is a, is a privilege for minority groups. The ability to isolate in a safe and spacious home, work remotely, we had full digital access and sustain monthly, monthly income are component of this privilege that most minority lack or cannot afford. Hospital and minority and poor neighborhood were ill-equipped and understaffed to begin with, and racism and discrimination was embedded in the social fabric of the system. This was manifested in access to treatment, testing, and right now in vaccine trial recruitment and participation. So just to give you an example of how this implication relate to the current situation of, of minority. Wealth is an indicator of financial stability. And as can be seen here, Black and Hispanic with a bachelor degree or higher, actually have a lower media net worth than whites without a bachelor degree education. So this is equivalent to 17 cents for, for a Hispanic um, and 15 cents for African-American for every dollar a, or for every, Net, net worth dollar that a white individual had. We can also look at income inequality. Going back to 1968, the gap remained literally the same. So for every dollar an African-American earned, 
uh, for every dollar a white individual earned, an African American earned 53 cents. And Hispanic, the pattern for Hispanic is not much different than that. As I said before, hospital and minority and poor neighborhood were understaffed and has substandard equipment. In New York City, for example, the Bronx and Queens were the borough more affected by the pandemic. But they were the one with the lowest number of acute care hospital and with the uh, lower proportion or ratio of beds uh, per 100,000 population. When MD were being um, sent from other states to help out, the majority of the physicians were staying in, in Manhattan where the, the actual um, burden of the virus was the lowest. There is evidence that show that the ratio of nurse to, to patient in, in Queens, for example, was one to 20, when in Manhattan was one to five. So where, where you end up with the virus determine whether you will survive or not in New York City. And I can, I, I'm sure this was, this was and is the, the situation in other places right now. Even before the recent events of policy, the of police brutality and the Black Lives Matter movement and protest, the Harvard, Harvard School of Public Health conducted the discrimination in American survey and a representative sample of approximately 3,500 adults between January and April 2017. And at that time, they noticed that the survey, that the the perception of discrimination was at, at the highest for all groups. No, no, um, no surprise right there, given the racist and divisive rhetoric used by the current administration. So as I have been laid out before, and I'm not going to repeat a lot of that, the underlying cause of health inequity are complex. And they include a, several factors, just to name a few. And this factor can either act independent or jointly, and especially in our society, to affect, to affect health outcome. The sad part of this is that most of these factors are avoidable or modifiable. So from that point of view, the health inequity that we observe are unfair on an issue of social justice for all of us. So what do we do? So as was mentioned by Dr. G, race and ethnicity um, are, are key here, especially to capture information about racism. They are master status factor, multidimensional, that sort of has and continue to shape opportunity and access to resources they determine where we live and the resources available in, in our neighborhood. Thus, it is important that we advocate not only for collection of better quality of data on race and ethnicity, but also at the place level, because that will allow us to examine inequity between and within groups. As we have seen before, they, they, there are um, inequity within the group by either how they identify whether they are foreign or uh, US born, socioeconomic status, and that get lost when the data is poor collected or is aggregated. We need to actually look at, uh, uh, take a look in depth to our healthcare system and put the money where our mouth is. It is a, it's a shame that we spend 18% of our GDP in healthcare and we have worse condition on most of the developed country that spend half of the money we spend in the OECD union. And finally, we need to advocate for a top-down approach to address the social determinant of health, especially racism. Racism affects all of us, regardless of race and ethnicity. 
we all are carrying our the health consequences of racism and discrimination. This is an issue of unity, and we are at a crucial time in our lifetime, and we must act to make a change. So with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you so much. So those are those are our three presentations, and I know we have a, um, a quite a few questions in the queue. Um, but I first want to thank all three of our speakers for your very thoughtful remarks. Um, you, know, you really, um, you really, I think, hit the high notes not not just from a historical perspective, but tying them very uh, distinctly to current events and our, and our current challenges that we're facing here in the United States. So I'm gonna take the moderator's privilege and, and ask a question that I wanna ask first. <laughs> and Dr. Fullalove, you alluded to this a little bit in, in your uh, presentation. So, um, you know, clearly COVID has highlighted what we know to be longstanding, persistent inequities in health status across this nation. Um, some people are, are just waking up to this, just, just um, now starting to acknowledge this. As we look forward um, to a COVID vaccine, hopefully uh, in early 2021, um, you know, we certainly cannot expect there to be widespread uptake of the vaccination. And, and we in public health will be tasked with advocating for that uptake. And we know that historically, populations of color have been distrustful of systems, um, understandably, as many of you have, have described from our history. My question for, um, for any of the panelists, um, Dr. Fullalove, you started to allude to this though in your presentation, is you know, as, as public health professionals, um, what are some tactics that we might consider to, uh, to promote that successful uptake, which, which will be critical um, for our success as a nation? You know, I very much appreciate the question, uh, especially since it's one that I pose to many of the students that I taught in prison who are now home, I sort of said, so you're in the community. Um, many of you have had substantial losses as a result of this virus. We're gonna have a vaccine at some point in time. What do we have to do to make sure that folk in places like there are actually gonna be okay about taking it? The best response I got said, don't make giving me a vaccine, the only way you attack the health disparities that exist all over the place. If I get a sense that you're gonna ignore all the folk with chronic conditions like hypertension, diabetes, and what have you, I think Luis's talk on this is really terrific. If I'm in a community that's suffering from these kinds of health disparities, and the only thing you have for me is a vaccine that's gonna make a pharmaceutical rich, oh no, I'm not gonna be interested. So I think being, absolutely about how much all the things that we've described in this conference have to be part of the public health agenda. It's not just COVID-19, it's health disparities create reservoirs for this virus that have to be eliminated, not with a vaccine, but with really appropriate, adequate, and passionate attention to what are we gonna to do to clear this up? If you wanna get the vaccine, Show me that you are attending to all the public health crises that exist in these neighborhoods. And then I might be, then I might trust you when you tell me that this is something that I'm going to take, that I should take, and that's going to have an impact on my health. Yeah, I want to build on that because the vaccine is going to do nothing to fixing racism. It's going to do nothing to facing income inequality. So unless we, you know, think uh, in parallel to having policies that not only promote, you know, the vaccine to take care of the, you know, the pandemic, the medical part of it. We, and at the same time, if we don't have any kind of buttressing of the economic fallout, you know, that's inevitably happening or, or currently happening, we're not going to make a lot of inroads. You know, um, we're already seeing, especially here in California, but also I know in other places, multiple kind of uh, disasters, right? You know, we got the whole West Coast on fire and there's floods and hurricanes everywhere else, you know, and we are soon to move into winter. So things are probably going to get worse before things get better. Um, and when we think about the recovery, you know, the vaccine is not going to help the economy 
much at all, except for some of the corporations, as 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 uh, Dr. Kovalev mentioned. So we really need to think structurally about fixing the foundations of our society. I, I would like to add also that given the low participation of Hispanic and Black on the clinical trial for the vaccine, it is unlikely that there is a trust in the community that this is going to even go work or reach out to them. So that is going to be a, a situation that needs to be solved before we even think about a vaccine that we don't even know if it's going to be effective. Thank you. And, and Dr. Borrell, I was, I was actually going to ask you, you made a comment in your last slide that we must have a top-down approach to address racism. Can you elaborate a little on that? I think that that's what you're alluding to. Yeah, I think we need to really do a soul searching from the level of the administration and embed it in our agency that this is a problem. We need to recognize that. And this is a problem that affects everyone, regardless of the color of the skin. Because when I live in a neighborhood that is not 100% Hispanic or is not 100% Black, whatever affect me affect everyone living in my neighborhood. So at the end of the day, we are all carrying the heavy weight of racism, whether it's at the institutional or at the structural level. So we definitely need to look at our institution and change the attitude and the way we operate. Thank you. So this question is for Dr. Fullalove. Uh, the question uh, from one of our participants is, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a huge push for collecting and manufacturing PPE, ventilators, and tests for hospitals and nursing homes. Did prisons get a similar flood of resources, or are they overlooked? You know, the big thing that uh, I think one always has to keep in mind is that the prison system in the United States is actually 50 different systems. So the answer to the question is, it depends on the state. State prisons vary from one location to another. And the notions about how they're gonna make use of the labor that is available to them on the part of incarcerated persons also varies as well. So there are some where you're gonna get some compensation, but what I believe is the case uniformly everywhere is that uh, these are the places where you are probably gonna get not very much in the way of resources. There might have been a moment when the notion that you could produce these things more cheaply in settings like this was paramount. But recall for the longest time, we had a terrible shortage in all the PPE, which had to do with the national crisis and figuring out how to do this. So yeah, prisons could have been a part of it. And in some cases they were, but they're also part of a national system of disarray. We simply could not get our act together as a nation. And you know, prisons, once again, a definite possible resource actually used by some states, but not in a routine fashion. And they, like everybody else, fell victim to the inability on the part of the top-down approach that we needed for this epidemic to have the folk at the top take care of the distribution of resources that would have made everybody a lot healthier. Good question. And uh, sad to say that uh, this is one of the enduring issues with mass incarceration that long after COVID-19 is gone, we as a nation are gonna to have to address. Thank you. This next question is addressed to Dr. G, but I, I really am interested in, in perspectives from all the panelists. The question is, how do we address or respond to those who deny concrete data? How do we close that knowledge gap with others? Yeah, you know, I. If we're talking at, I, I think it depends on what level we're talking about, right? If we're talking about individuals, you know, I think that some measure of empathy and connection makes some sense because I think a lot of times people, we're moving into a situation where I think there's a lot of distrust about um, elitism, uh, you know, elites, you know, um, there's also a lot of distrust about the knowledge that we're getting. You know, some of this has been produced by academics, you know, kind of postmodernism and all those kinds of things. It's been produced because we've been advocating for critical perspectives, 
but we're also, I think some of that distrust has been manufactured um, by uh, corporate entities that have a vested interest in uh, denying climate change, right? And so I think it's part of a broader kind of movement that has really tried to dissuade people from having trust in science and really trying to say, well, you know, if you just kind of believe this and I believe that, that's okay. Um, and who's to say my belief is any better than your belief? It, it's also got to do with how we present some of the information in media. So taking, you know, uh, climate change as an, uh, as an example, you know, if you took a hundred scientists, 99 of them would say, yes, you know, we have a crisis on our hands. And there might be one scientist who may kind of think otherwise, but you put them on TV and you have one and one, then it feels like, oh, well, you know, the scientific community, half of them think this way, half of them that way, rather than 99 out of hundred. So I think that's another part of it. I think once we really start to take a harder look at how we kind of present data, but also making people feel that the information that they get is applicable, that if we can find a way to have more consistent media channels, especially in uh, disasters, when people are getting information from lots of different sources and they're all saying different things, then it's very confusing for people. And at some point they just kind of wave their hands and say, they give up because they, they don't know what to think. They don't know what to believe. So then they just end up believing the people that they trust. And the people they trust may not necessarily have the most accurate information. So I think we really need to start rebuilding our confidence um, in science, making it so that things like math are actually fun and cool rather than something to be feared and disdained. Um, I think we need to have academics be more accessible and not look like they're that we're just these elites and we're too smart and too good for everybody else. I think that's been a problem that we ourselves have done I've heard that from a lot of people. They think, oh, you're better than me because you have a degree and that's not the case, you know? Um, and really making people feel that, you know, uh, when somebody has worked deeply in some area that, you know, they, they're, we should, you know, pay some attention to them, but at the same time be critical. I think some healthy skepticism is, is what we need. So I think we really need to think about it both at the personal level to connect with people, but also, you know, at, across all these other things, how we do school and how we present things in the media that I think will start to regain some measure of trust and confidence. Thank you. Do the other panelists have any comments on that? Yeah, I, I'd like to comment. Um, I am in a state of terror about where we are right now. Science is just another voice in the room. The idea that I can take somebody with a Nobel Prize and say, hey, this guy knows what he's talking about. You need to listen to him. That's what we've done for many years. And now that person, that Nobel Prize winner, might be described as somebody who's part of the conspiracy. So instead of being a choice, trusted voice, once again, just another voice in the room. I'm really mindful of what happened in the Middle Ages. The Catholic Church could not pray its way out of the bubonic plague, the Black Death. As a consequence, what happens? When prayer didn't work <clears throat> to prevent massive morbidity and mortality, the enlightenment happens. All of a sudden you have another worldview that, that emerges. It's science as opposed to faith. Science as opposed to a belief in the doctrines of the Catholic Church. I think that's where we are right now. <clears throat> I think we are part of the voice of authority that has been so challenged that because of our inability to science our way out of where we are now, people are looking for other explanations. They're looking for other sources of leadership. They're looking for other objects and ideas to believe in. And I, I'm afraid that we're not up to the task. The folk who are trained the way we are, yeah, we got them. But in an epidemic where you have to have everybody pretty much on board doing the same things and believing in the same things, I don't know, I'm, I'm like I said, I, I have no answers. I have a lot of questions and I have a lot of fears that I'm easily able to articulate, but answers, no. I think we have them. It's just that I can't get anybody, we can't get anybody to believe in what we have as solutions enough so that as a nation, as a world, we start putting money where our mouths are, where our scientific mouths are. I, I, I'm worried. Thank you. Dr. Borrell, did you want to comment on that? Sure. I think that the main problem is the 
pol politicization of the media. When if I, I, I am in a particular party, I want to listen to this channel. If I am in this party, I, I want to listen to this channel. So we don't have a unifying message. And in most cases, as being say here, the message is contradicting each other or either sort of downplay what the other is saying. So we, we have a big problem with that because we don't have a trust unify message for nothing. And that's a, a big problem. Yeah. I, you know, I was discussing this with a colleague the other day and the only word I could think of to describe the politicization potentially of MMWR uh, from CDC is just heartbreaking. I, I can't, I could not think of another word to describe that. Dr. Borrell, you, I know you had the microphone. I'd like to ask another question of you, if I may. Um, this is from um, one of our uh, participants. How do you think the idea of the Hispanic paradox is going to change as a result of this epidemic? Is this a concept that we need to rethink in epidemiology? Well, the, we have been rethinking the, con the concept for a while now. Uh, because as I say, the concept was originally developed with the Mexican American population in mind, no to apply to all the population. In fact, if we uh, try to look some of the outcome of the Puerto Rican population, they are very similar to the African American uh, or black population. And that apply for better outcome for um, mortality and morbidity. So the paradox is a romanticized idea that doesn't apply to everyone. And absolutely, we need to revisit all the time. And there are many explanations that have been hypothesized around this, such as social support, uh, healthy migrant effect, salmon bias, you name it. But we had debunk some of those theory. And the idea here is that we need to disaggregate the information and this is not unique to Hispanic, to be clear. This applied to Asian, this applied to African-American, this applied to white. We need to disaggregate the data to sort of identify the group that are more disadvantaged within uh, categories that are considered homogeneous. So the, the paradox is a work in progress. Thank you. My pleasure, thank you. This next question is for Dr. G. So the question is, since the roots and consequences of racism are deeply embedded in each of the social determinants of health, what recommendations do you have for conducting research and developing policies that impact multiple points and deflate the entire ball? That's a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I really wish I had good answers to it. I, I think we need to develop some better tools in research um, because, you know, like if we if we think about how we typically do research, you know, we we have you know regression methodology that's really good at looking, you know, at you know a couple of variables, and we can look at the mediation and moderation, and then we have some tools for looking at longitudinal data and things like that. But you know, we really don't have great tools for looking at systems and how they work in sort of reciprocal fashions and things like that. There's some emerging work, you know, from system science and things like that, but we really need to, I think, develop better tools for kind of modeling that complexity. But then we also need better tools for monitoring racism. You know, my viewpoint is we live in a total racist society. That's my starting point. So that means that we have racism everywhere. Maybe we haven't seen it or we haven't been able to articulate it or measure it, but we need to do a better job of that. And we need to develop data systems, <clears throat> excuse me, similar to, for example, the data that was developed from the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act or the HUMDA, right? That was a system that was designed explicitly from community members that said, hey, you know what? Even with the advent of desegregation, um, we can't afford mortgages to, you know, kind of uh, buy homes and things like that. So then essentially we created a, data, a monitoring system whereby if you go to a bank today and you apply for a mortgage, 
the bank has to report on your gender, on your race, and a bunch of other things like that in order to allow us to monitor at the bank level and at the industry level whether discrimination is happening in banking, right? We need the same things. We need all those kinds of things in like if you're applying for an auto loan and trying to buy a car, uh, going to a hospital, your schools, policing, and so forth. We need to have some of the data there. And we also need to have the ability to follow the money and to see the connections across these institutions, right? So, you know, from my point of view, in order to deflate the ball, it's not just looking at the individual little nodes, it's actually looking at how they work to give each other support in Slack, you know? Part of the reason why the, um, uh, why police feel uh, fairly comfortable in doing their business as usual is because they understand that the courts and other politicians want, would not have their back. And so once we, but, so we need to start tackling all these systems simultaneously. I don't think our methodology is there and it would be amazing to be able to collect the data and develop the analytical tools to see that. And that really requires, I believe, building a, a much stronger cadre of researchers who are people of color, who are women, and from all other communities so that we can actually see what we haven't seen before. I love that point. I, I full I full heartedly agree with you know adding greater diversity um, you know to the public health professional ranks and as well as to those of us in academia. I think that's critical. Thank you. Here's a, here's a question for any of you who wants to answer. In the context of the current crisis exacerbated by the killings of Black men and women, what role should public health specifically play in this? What should we be public health. I uh, contributed to the writing and publication of a book called From Enforcers to Guardians, a public health primer on ending police violence. Hannah Fisher and Mindy Pulilov are the authors. They specifically tackle this issue. Now, because Mindy Pulilov and I have been working together since 1982, 30 years as a husband and wife team, and for the rest, as an interesting divorced couple that still works together. I think I can plug the book, especially since it's available free of charge from Johns Hopkins Press. Look it up online, you'll see that it's available. Part of what it does is recognize one important fact. Public health was late getting to understand the role of police violence in public health, because when it was all white men, they looked around, saw their lives, and never saw the problems that people of color see almost as a matter of routine. As soon as you diversify the public health workforce, especially at the university level, the assumption that everything was well with the police suddenly gets challenged. Now you have a whole bunch of information that does try to look deeply into what are we gonna do about issues like this. One of the things that's pointed out is that we have a very inconsistent way of collecting data about police-involved mortality. Uh, this is where Dr. G's point is so critical. Almost all the data we have is not from public health sources. It's not even from government sources. It's from the Guardian. It's from the Washington Post, which means that if monitoring police violence and then having communities enabled and empowered to actually do something about identifying issues of the type we've been seeing almost on a weekly basis since March, then you can start to be clear that there are other viewers, other actors who are able to look at this data, understand where there's a problem and come up with something that looks like a community faceted, a community oriented set of solutions. I think if we have better tools or able to monitor it better and then can act on what it is that our monitoring data tells us, we'll start to see some really, really important results. It becomes a public health issue because the violence that is often a part of these encounters makes it something that we in public health are supposed to be monitoring. Violence, intentional injuries, homicides, all those things are our purview. Thinking about how to prevent them means that maybe we should be number one outside of the forces of law and order to really look at these problems and come up with potential solutions. Thank you. Others that want to comment? So I echo what both. Thank you. So I want to uh, go back just uh, to a topic we were talking about earlier. Dr. G, you 
um, were commenting on how we need to do a better job of measuring racism. So I teach a class on this and we talk about the tools that are out there. We talk about the different levels of racism. So I'd like to hear from you, but also from the other panelists, um, what, what specific suggestions do you have to improve the way that we currently measure racism? Yeah, so first of all, we should talk offline because I, I teach a class on that too. And I'd love to, we should probably put our heads together. I'd love to learn from you. Um, but I, a couple of years ago, I created a new class on uh, measuring structural racism. And, you know, certainly the individual discrimination stuff is important and looking at things like implicit bias is important. And we do have a few other tools like residential segregation, you know, indices like that. And, and we have some data sets looking at redlining and things like that. Um, but I think that's just really the tip of the iceberg. And so the class that I developed is actually a brainstorming class as much as it is everything else. You know, we reviewed pair testing, we've reviewed, you know, uh, uh, the things that are out there. But actually, like half of the class, I asked my students to tell me from their experiences and from what they've read and seen in their communities and their friends and family, where they're seeing discrimination and how we might what kind of data plausibly, if you could just kind of pie in the sky and just brainstorm, what would you see? And so the students were doing things like looking at uh, discrimination in our syllabi, you know, and syllabi so white, hashtag that, right? Uh, they were looking at discrimination in Yelp reviews, you know, they were talking about discrimination in parks, right? And so this was predating uh, you know, the green book and, you know, uh, movie, but, you know, obviously there was a real green book prior to the movie, right? And so the students were telling me like what they saw and then we were trying to inspire them from, okay, here are some existing tools. How can we take, for example, the index of dissimilarity and apply it to say college admissions? You know, are we segregating students in admissions? Are we segregating syllabi? You know, are we segregating Yelp reviews and things like that? So it's kind of taking that, some of the existing stuff and just trying to apply it in wacky creative ways. And, you know, I think part of what structural racism does is it tells people that their ideas are not valued. And so one of the things I try to do in my class is reverse that and say, your experiences are actually really valuable. And I want to honor that. And you guys are going to be picking up, you know, this, this, uh, you know, you're going to be climbing and building all this stuff, you know, when I'm done, you know, and, uh, with this. And so we really are dependent on, you know, um, all the generations, you know, working together and we all pull together to learn and see what we haven't been able to see in the, in the research literature. And I know the research part is very limited, you know, because even if you're in school, you, by virtue of that, you have some advantages to begin with, but it's a good starting point because at least in academics, we can provide space and vocabulary for important ideas like intersectionality and things like that. And so, um, yeah, so those are some of the things that we, you know, we've tried to do and I'd love to hear and learn from all the rest of you. That's great. I, I love, I love that concept of, um, you know, as, as faculty, you know, I have often said we learn, we learn just as much from our students as they learn from us. And the sim same is true for communities, working directly with communities. Um, we only have about five minutes left for questions. Um, I have um, a couple of questions that, that I want to make sure I get to. Uh, one, Dr. Full of Love, is for you. And this question from a participant is, is it possible for the Bard Prison Initiative to thrive in the South, specifically in places such as Colonial Virginia, where Confederate history is strong? Um, excellent question. Uh, you know, I, I think the wonderful thing about being on Zoom is that it gives me a semi-youthful appearance. I'm going to be 77 years old in January. I don't think I look that. My students tell me I don't look a day over 73. I'm somebody who was part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. John Lewis, the late John Lewis, was the chairman of, this, of SNCC from 63 to 66. So for two years, he was sort of my boss. I'm very clear, having myself been arrested a number of times and doing a little less than a month in a jail in Jackson, Mississippi in 1955. Yeah, of all the places that need it, it would certainly be there. 
But if you look like look at Angola and all those other places, part of what makes the Bard Prison Initiative work is that the folk who run the prisons are very clear. If you have your best and brightest minds working on college courses, they're not engaged in a lot of the stuff that often causes real problems for the security of the, uh, of the, of the facility. If you get your best students engaged in struggling with Thoreau, dealing with Wittgenstein or struggling with epidemiology, they don't have uh, that much that's gonna also filter into some of the problems that are so frequently associated with having complex and very diverse bodies of uh, individuals in, in prison settings like that. I believe that if folks saw it as an economic advantage and saw that in getting out, you dramatically increase the likelihood that someone will get a job and as a result of getting a job won't come back, a lot of states will see the logic of that, not so much because they're all about prison liberation, but largely because it will serve the bottom line. The prison budget is often huge in many states and trying to figure out how to meet that cost, but also satisfy the general public that what's being done is in their safety. If they saw that keeping people from going back to prison save money and also makes a lot of our communities a lot safer, then I think they'd see the logic of it and they'd find a way to do it. But at this point in the 21st century, given the notion that law and order is probably going to be a major issue in the presidential election. If Donald Trump wins, I assume that law and order is going to probably lead to increasing the prison population, not reducing it. So the idea that when you're actually trying to control the problems in the streets by throwing people in prison, the idea that you'd offer, offer an education there, uh, probably not. The sense and the feeling I get from um, the US in general, is that if you're afraid of us invading your suburban communities, you're not likely to also want your tax dollars to go to making sure that I can read the road. So I'd love to see it happen, but I don't think it's likely. Thank you. And I'm gonna make this our last question. I know we have questions we were unable to get to you all for, for sending us your terrific questions. Um, and this is the uh, one that I'd like to end on because I think we have a number of university students uh, joining us today, undergrad and graduate students. Um, and this question, um, again, to all the panelists is, how do you suggest combating system, systemic racism on a practical level? What kind of grassroots changes um, could we, the college aged population, engage in? register to vote and vote. I mean, more than anything else in a society like ours, your voice counts. If you wanna do something, be clear about how much racism is infused in the current dialogue that's going on about this election. Do something about it and vote to make things different. I cannot agree with that more. We have an opportunity of our lifetime and we, this is going to be the time. I, I would, uh, third, that <laughs> definitely vote, but also get out the vote, you know, organize to get other people to vote. I think there's going to be a lot of barriers to voting, especially in key states. So to the extent that you can help other people vote, you know, um, you know, we have some privileges just by being virtue, you know, uh, of being associated with the university and we should use some of that to try to help other people. Uh, to get out the votes, you know, dismiss some of this misinformation that's out there about voting and, and all that kind of stuff. And then also organize at your own campus. Maybe you can, you know, make some changes at your local campus and use that as practice for things that you can think about doing for the rest of your life too. And also beyond the campus, these are things that we can do in our communities. That's terrific. Well, thank you all so much for your thoughtful remarks and for your contributions to this stimulating discussion. It's, it's been a delight. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Nancy Schoenberg, who is gonna provide some concluding remarks for us. Dr. Nancy Schoenberg serves as the Marion Pearsall Professor of Behavioral Science at UK's College of Medicine. She is the founder of the Center for Health Equity Transformation She's also UK's Associate Vice President for Health Disparities and an Associate Director of UK's Center for Clinical and Translational Sciences. 
She's a medical anthropologist and gerontologist by background. Dr. Schoenberg's research involves addressing health inequities, particularly among rural residents and other served populations. Her research has been continuously funded uh, for 20 plus years, mainly by NIH. And I'm also lucky to count her as a friend and colleague. So Dr. Schoenberg, I'm pleased to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. And I just know that I am, I am the thing that stands between you and your lunch. So I'm going to make my comments kind of brief or in, in Dr. G's case, breakfast maybe. So listening to these amazing, illustrious uh, panelists as well as the organizers brings up a couple of points in my mind that I want to share with you. And these are not, uh, uh, these are not terrifically uh, high powered thoughts. Well, they may be high powered, but they're not necessarily original thoughts. Um, but I think they're important to keep in mind. One is our need to embrace and live the motto, united we stand, divided we fall. This is not a uniquely American concept. This concept was introduced maybe six thousands of years ago, but there are some out there who would suggest that there is not sufficient room or the resources to address all forms of inequality. Dr. G makes an incredibly important point when he focuses on the narrative of division. His compelling recently published or soon to be published data about negative stereotypes against Asian these days, the quote unquote Chinese virus show that there are political forces that leverage division for their own sake and own purposes. I am not a virus. That is so um, sad. It's so horrible. Shouldn't the focus be on the virus as the enemy and not the people as the enemy? Dr. Burrell's focus is also um, uh, emphasizing the importance of lack of division. She says, let's use data. Let's look at who's suffering. Let's understand the disproportionate burden from the virus and, and understand this within the broader social context. She says, use research as our tool. And also, in addition to the advice to vote, use the census, fill out the census, she says. Make sure you do that. And then let's address it all. Let's look at our root causes. Let's look at income and housing. And as Dr. Folov emphasizes education, the power of keeping people busy and doing important work. Let's turn away from the agendas of division where there are egregious inequalities and racism. Let's address them. Let's expand the pie rather than cutting smaller and smaller pieces. Here's a local example grounded in history as Dr. Folov reminds us we must do all the time. In response to increasing demand for coal in the early 20th century, many coal companies sought labor. Similar to global trends, unionization at the time was gaining traction. A lot of coal companies were very, very concerned about unionization. In response to concerns about unionization, as well as in response to increasing demands for coal, they brought in immigrants from a wide swath of society, poor black sharecroppers and others who were unable to communicate with each other and because of laws of segregation, oftentimes unable to live near each other. If you cannot talk to your coworker, if you live in a different town, then it's easy to slip into othering and it's easy to make ourselves the enemy rather than the structural forces that really are, are those that, that take away our humanity. As Dr. Burrell and Dr. Arnett at the beginning notes, where you live matters, whether it's Appalachia, the Queens, the Bronx, or redlining in Lexington. Agendas of division time and time again have been used to thwart progress. And as our esteemed colleagues say, Dr. Uh, Perez Figueroa says, let's use all of our professional tools to address inequalities. And as Dr. Cardarelli said, what about public health practitioners? Let's use, let's use our tools there. Let's be part of the solution. Let's make research more accessible, says Dr. G. Let's make sure that we decrease elitism. 
Let's address, as Dr. Folov calls it, the, e e the ecology of inequality by not only studying history, but using evidence programs to actually address. Look at the BARD program. Look at many other programs that are evidence-based. We like research. We love research. And why not use it and leverage it? If we don't have a unified message, says Dr. Burrell, then we risk it all. We risk losing our humanity. Let's not limit uh, how to address inequality through a vaccine, through rely relying on a shot in the arm. Let's address something bigger and broader and look forward to the day that we can provide for everyone opportunities that underlie health equity. Thank you all for this wonderful, marvelous um, opportunity to to listen, to be learned, uh, to be educated, and then to, to move forward and, and let's get to work. Thank you, Dr. Schoenberg. You know, your comments um, call to mind that I'll speak for myself, but I suspect there are many of us who in the science world who have been disheartened over the last several months with the politicization of data and science. Uh, but today's talks really um, have energized and emboldened me um, to continue the fight, to continue to, to push you know, data-driven decision-making, um, to um, be a part um, of the national discussion about structural racism and where the solutions lie. So again, I just wanna thank all of our speakers. Um, you know, I, I am heartened by every one of you and the work that you're doing. I look forward to continuing to collaborate with you um, I want to thank all of our participants for joining us today uh, and remind you that the session was recorded. You will receive an email with a link to today's uh, session. And then lastly, I would encourage you uh, as participants and panelists to continue to follow the University of Kentucky and the work that we're doing in this space. Uh, you can follow us on social media. We have um, several other events that are coming up this semester, but of course our work continues. So. Thank you all uh, so much for your efforts today. Um, there, that's Allison showing you how you can follow us on social media. Um, but I, I, you know, again, I, I, I really hope that this is a call to action for many of you uh, listening today that, that you will uh, play your role in addressing racism. So with that, um, University of Kentucky thanks you all and uh, I hope that you will stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.